without further ado, this is uh, machine learning with Apache Airflow. So of course, who am I? I'm Daniel. I'm an Airflow engineer at astronomer.io. I'm a PMC member for the Apache Airflow project. And important to this, pro to this specifically is I've actually also been working on uh, data science platforms for the last five to seven years at companies such as Apple and Bloomberg LP. And so I've been able to see how some of these larger companies handle dealing with data scientists. So let's talk a bit about the data ecosystem at a uh, tech company. So the main data ecosystem is a collaboration between data scientists, data infrastructure, and the data analyst teams, all trying to come together to basically turn large amounts of data into actions that can create value for the company. So the data scientists, they essentially just want things to, and each, each of these uh, players have different goals that, they're re that they need to do their jobs effectively. Uh, so data scientists essentially just want things to work. They want high level APIs, they want to be able to set system parameters, but they don't want to have to really understand the guts of what's going on. A data scientist doesn't want to have to understand how Kubernetes works. They want to just say, I want a machine with a GPU that can run TensorFlow. You then have the data infrastructure teams, and the data infrastructure teams mostly care about stability. They want to offer flexibility to the data scientists, but they want to maintain the structure to prevent any user errors, and they don't want to the biggest thing is they want monitoring so they can ensure that the, cl the cluster that they're managing has as much uptime as possible. And then, of course, you have data uh, analysts who want easy access to data via SQL or Python, and they mostly focus on the business problems. So their main thing is essentially turning these, uh, receiving the data in something like a SQL database and uh, distributing it to the business side in the form of dashboards. And to best handle this system, we want to create something called a bumper rail model, where you can essentially have as much flexibility as you want within the, the, the railing. But once you go outside of the expected parameters, you quickly get uh, alerted that you should be moving back inwards. And um, this is often the time when a lot of companies start thing, thinking that they should build their own data science platform. But as someone who has helped build multiple data science platforms, I do ask that you consider not building your own from scratch because yes, each company has its own specific business logic, but managing a data science platform is a very large effort that can take a lot of time. And anytime anything goes wrong, you're basically on your own. So how do you create a manageable, flexible data science platform without building it from scratch? And essentially, I'm here to argue that Airflow is a really good base layer for a data science platform. And I like to think of it as a data science platform platform. So what are the main goals when you're building a data science platform? Well, the main goals are to reduce the complexity for the data scientists so they can focus on the algorithms and model building. Um, to allow them to allow the data scientists to interact with the data uh, and monitor the health of the pipeline and to create a healthy ecosystem where the data engineers, data scientists, and data analysts are all empowered to use their data to meet their goals. And so this is where we kind of talk about which, how each of these players can best use an Airflow-based data science platform to uh, best empower the other players. So how would you use Airflow as a data engineer is essentially you want to create like the bounds for your data scientists. And the easiest way to do that is by using, uh, by extending operators and creating custom operators. So when you think of things like the Kubernetes pod operator, the bash operator, the spark submit operator, these are very open ended operators where you could actually extend those classes and use them as building blocks to create something that's much more customized to your company's logic. And you can also create what are called DAG templates for simple ETL jobs to essentially make it that the fewest number of people have to write DAGs as possible. So for the case of custom operators, let's take the case where you manage a Kubernetes cluster that has a specific node that has GPUs. And you want to offer 
um, a TensorFlow operator to your data scientist that is guaranteed to be in a GPU-based node? Well, the easiest way to do that would be to create a custom TensorFlow operator that extends the Kubernetes operator, and you guarantee that it's using a TensorFlow image, and you also guarantee that it has the node selector that it is a GPU-based node. Um, this way, your data scientists don't need to know that, oh, I have to set these labels so that Kubernetes knows how to uh, get create a GPU-based job. Um, and what's also great is that with these custom operators, you get the benefit that as Airflow releases new versions, uh, you'll get the most up-to-date changes and bug fixes and new features that the rest of the community is both donating and supporting. Uh, so now building a data science platform is as simple as writing a few plugins and operators rather than creating something from scratch. Uh, when it comes to creating DAG templates, the, the reasoning here is that for a lot of simple pipelines, we want to allow data science analysts and scientists to schedule airflow jobs without creating DAGs from scratch, uh, especially for simple things like submitting a SQL statement. The, there's a certain amount of boilerplate code that doesn't really need to be recreated every time. And there's two ways of doing this. There's using DAG triggers and DAG generators to uh, offer these up to your engineers. And this means that a small team of data engineers can support a large number of DAGs because they no longer have to spend as much time debugging when data analysts and data scientists have trouble with the DAG creation process. So the example of using trigger arguments is that Airflow has something called the dagrun.conf, where when you trigger a DAG, you can actually supply a JSON object, uh, and Airflow will read that JSON object and use Jinja templating to put in those values. So now you can actually ch like say, point to different SQL files based on what you want to do that specific run. But there's also this idea of creating DAG generators. And so here's a very simple example where let's say we have a SQL DAG template and we just want to be able to change the DAG name and the SQL file that it's pointing towards. In this case, now you'll be able to create 20 different DAGs that run 20 different SQL files on a regular schedule. And the amount of code that your data analyst will have to write is just calling a single function. Now let's talk a little bit about how to use Airflow as a data scientist. Um, with custom, so if you're a data scientist with a data engineering team that has built these custom operators, using these custom operators kind of allows you to focus more on the actual application level. So like doing the data exploration, figuring out how to use the TensorFlow job, how to use these different operators. Um, but what I would like to say is that for data scientists, try to keep the actual data at the actual data communication, the actual data exploration outside of Airflow and use Airflow more as a scheduling productionization layer. So things like Jupyter and Databricks notebooks are fantastic ways of interacting with uh, the data. And then once you have each of these steps down to what you think is a good, like uh, once you have these steps down, you can then use Airflow to tie it all together. And that way you don't even have to change the notebook uh, you don't even have to change the Airflow DAG when you make changes to the notebook. So when you're running Jupyter and Airflow, you can actually use Airflow to inject secrets and environment variables, such as maybe like the URL for a different Spark clusters, depending on whether you're in dev staging or production. And each of these notebooks can become an item potent task. And then once you're once you have a notebook the way you want it, you can actually use a system called Paper Mill which is a project within the Jupyter ecosystem, which essentially allows you to parameterize notebooks. And uh, we have here a quick demo of how Papermill works. So the way that Papermill works is through cell tagging. And essentially the idea here is that you can tag a cell as a parameter cell. And then what will happen is, uh, as you see here, initially the values are A and B, but Papermill actually takes advantage of the fact that you can essentially put in a uh, cell just below the parameter cell. And that what that means is that uh, the new, it will create a new uh, notebook 
And this output notebook will actually inject the new values just below the, uh, the original values and run, rerun that notebook. And so now um, it's easy to modify the notebook between DAG runs, and it essentially turns these notebooks into Python operators. And this, once again, kind of keeps the complexity out of Airflow, which makes your Airflow DAGs easier to test. And now you can run this many times with different configurations. Uh, and of course, let's talk about how to use Airflow as a data analyst. And the way you use Airflow as a data analyst is more as a collaboration. So you want to communicate your needs with the data engineers so that they can create DAG templates for you. And by creating DAG templates for you, you minimize the amount of code you have the you as a data analyst have to write, and you ensure that you're doing things that are within the expectations of the data engineers. And uh, finally, I want to talk a little bit about the process of creating a data science pipeline within Apache Airflow. And so, like, kind of to bring it all together as a whole, you know, there's three main steps to creating a data science pipeline. There's experimentate, parameterizing, and productionizing. And I believe that through the process of using Jupyter to experiment and Papermill to parameterize, you end up with a system where you can now use Airflow to do a lot of the major uh, machine learning steps, things like hyperparameter tuning and canary testing. And I wanted to use canary testing as an example of what it would look like to use Airflow to essentially decide which of the models to deploy. So canary testing, for those who don't know, is a method for ensuring that your new models are an improvement compared to the older models. Uh, it can be used to detect model error, errors, such as like if there's a huge deviation in accuracy between the new model and the old one, or if the accuracy goes down, uh, it won't deploy the new model. And so here would be an example of using the Python branch operator to create a do canary testing, where initially we have it that the new value has a higher value than the originals. And so when we run that DAG, We'll see that it uh, compares the results and uh, deploys the new model. And so if we look here, the reason that that worked is because the, um, the old models all have values 0 through 4, and the new model actually has uh, a value of 5. But when we actually change the number of the model so that the, the, newer, the older models have a higher value than the new model, be through the Python branch operator, you're able to actually uh, have it that the old new model is not deployed and an alert is sent to the users. And there's easy ways of doing this for all sorts of uh, machine learning configurations. And so, essentially, in summary, um, for data engineers, using custom operators and DAG templates will simplify the DAG creation process for all other players. And it also simplifies your life because now you spend less time debugging with uh, your data analyst and figuring out what went wrong with their DAGs and can instead just create one template to handle 20 use cases. Uh, and by creating the custom operators, you essentially give the other players the flexibility to do what they want to do, but with the assurance that they're using these libraries in the way that you expect them to. And then data scientists should be using Airflow more as a glue to connect multiple Jupyter notebooks. Um, and, and once they have the data preparation the way they want it, they can use Airflow to create a production-ready ML pipeline from what was originally a series of data prep steps. Um, finally, of course, if you want to try Airflow out and are interested in having a well-tested, vendor-approved distribution, please reach out to either me personally or come check us out at astronomer.io. And thank you all so much for your time, and I look forward to any questions you might have about running Airflow on, uh, running machine learning operations on Airflow.
Great. Thanks so much for your presentation, Then Give us a second, because that was pretty quick. So uh, <laughs> give us a question to, to allow a, ten, a second to allow attendees to, to make some questions. Absolutely. Uh, so what I see you moved uh, downstairs. It was a nice view where you were transmitting from. <laughs> Well, yeah, um, unfortunately, uh, the I, I just moved this week, and I'm still trying to figure out where the Wi-Fi is good. Okay, so give us one second, please. Um, the slides you will be sharing these slides, right? Yes, of course. Okay, and we will publish them in the uh, event website in case anybody wants to take a look at them so give me about a minute to see if we have some questions in the meantime uh, a few reminders for everybody uh, we will after the next talk we will do uh, an event wrap up and we will do the raffle of the of the headset and the t-shirt and we will share some stats from final stats uh, about the Airflow Summit. Okay, we have the, our first question from Juan Pablo Braga. Uh, Juan Pablo asks us, which are the strengths of Airflow compared to Kubeflow? Yes, so MLflow is also one we're looking at very closely. I think that MLflow is a very cool piece of software. It, uh, it, it's a lot more opinionated in terms of what type, both MLflow and Kubeflow are more opinionated in the type of uh, pipelines you ex they expect you to be making. Um, so MLflow, a lot of the pipelines are very heavily based on building notebooks that are linear. Um, and Kubeflow is a lot more based within this kind of TensorFlow uh, Kubernetes-based ecosystem. Uh, Airflow does a lot, seems to kind of shine a lot more in terms of uh, speaking to external systems and kind of merging together multiple data sources and doing so in, a, in like a very flexible way. Um, so that's, I think that there's definitely, it's, it, there's a, there's going to be multiple articles that should have to come out about a deeper dive into comparison of all of those. But I would say that Airflow is a lot more flexible than the other two, but those two are very great if you're kind of trying to keep within the ecosystem that they're creating. Okay, thank you. Um, next question. How do you put machine learning models in production with Airflow? What is the deployment model? Do you have like, I mean, you went to read a bit in your talk, but I don't know if you could. Yeah, so more about that. what I would say is that, so I would, I would say that Airflow is not necessarily meant for the actual inference. So, you know, I wouldn't, have Airflow running to actually like have a cons like because Airflow is very heavily based on batch jobs. So I wouldn't have a task consistently running to do each prediction. But what Airflow can do is essentially put the model somewhere that's easy to pick up. So for example, you know, you could, but with the canary testing job I showed, you could have the deploy step be that the um, Airflow pushes the model into an S3 bucket. And then you can uh, have like a system that when it notices, like you could have a, a simple server that pulls from that S3 bucket and just does live inference. Uh, or you could have uh, some sort of like a Lambda function that once once that new S3 bucket is, is populated, it then can pull the model and serve uh, predictions. Okay. Um, did you know that we just reached 5,991 attendees already. That's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all so much for coming. <laughs> um, next question. Let me see if I understand it. Uh, I'll read it exactly how it is, and we'll figure it out. Sure, absolutely. How are you running model training pipeline using Airflow? Um. In terms of when, if you're asking how we're running in terms of like what ecosystems we're using, uh, I would say that for how to when, when you're running Airflow for model training, if you have something that's dealing with 
a large number of tasks and you want to have both a uh, good auto scaling story and the ability to kind of branch out and do a lot of model training at the same time, uh, I would say that probably one of the better ones would be the, uh, the Celery Executor with the Kata Auto Scaler. Um, the reason for that being that you can essentially uh, have a lot, like have the speed of existing workers. And then once all of your models are built, it will shrink down to zero. And then that way you're not wasting resources when, when the airflow is not running. Uh, in terms of the lower level infrastructure, I mean, uh, Astronomer personally, we're very much a Kubernetes shop and we've had very good luck in terms of uh, having lots of machine learning based clients using either our, like our cloud is based in Kubernetes or running it in their enterprise. Um, so I, I don't know if that, please let me know if that doesn't answer the question, but I do believe that like run, like in terms of a good infrastructure story, setting up with a Kubernetes cluster and airflow with some form of auto scaling uh, tends to work really well for our machine learning clients. Okay. Thank you. Um, next question is, any tips for increasing collaboration between data engineers and data scientists? Like what data set or model belongs to whom and who modified it recently? Yeah, I mean, I think that probably the best advice I can give on that is set clear boundaries of who should be doing what. Um, and what I mean by that is like by by having a clear understanding of where ownership lies, it allows both sides to empower the other. So if the, if the ML, if the data scientists under, if the data scientists believe that they should be handling what PIP packages are installed, that can inform how the data science platform is built. Like, should there be some sort of a pipeline where the data scientists can actually like, just like list what PIP modules they want? Should there be, uh, should there be some sort of a process where they can, may send in requests and have the base Docker images changed. Um, setting up these lines of who controls what allows there to kind of be responsibility of, hey, this, this request was sent a week ago and hasn't been acknowledged. Is this something that we should own since it seems like we change it very often? OK. Um, are there? Uh, any subfields of machine learning that Airflow is not ready to orchestrate yet? You know, like for example, image classification. Or um, I don't. I think that I think what's really great about Airflow is that it really can do like Airflow is as powerful as the amount of abstraction you do. And what I mean by that is. So like, let's say you're taking image class, you're doing image classification and there's a specific image classification library you want to use. Well, with the Kubernetes pod operator, if you have that image and you have the input and you have like essentially the inputs you want to put into it, you can run that image and Airflow is just doing the actual orchestration. Uh, Airflow is not a machine learning library. It doesn't, there's no native number crunching in Airflow. Therefore, as long as you have these kind of Kubernetes pod operator, bash operator, um, SSH operator, all of these systems that allow you to just perform arbitrary operations, Airflow can pretty much do anything. 